Hello, welcome to the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning (NPTEL), a joint venture by Indian Institutes of Technology and Indian Institute of Science. We are in the domain of literature, English language and literature and today we are going to start a new module on literary journals. I teach English at the Department of Humanities and Social Science at IIT Guwahati and it has been an experience all through the years teaching literature to engineering students and at the end of the day I find that it has become a beautiful experience when we uh, try to send Sensitize the students to the beauties and the wonders of interpretation of a literary text. When we talk of genres as such, we take it in the question of uh, uh, understanding the literary uh, domain, a uh, specific type of classification used for creative works of art, literature, music, or other creative pers pursuits. And this is usually characterized genre is usually characterized by a particular style, by particular themes, by form or content. Well, so let us look into when this uh, idea of the genre in literary uh, studies had really come into the fore. The earliest recorded systems of genre in western history can be traced back to Plato and Aristotle. Plato had only three imitational genres. He based it on dramatic dialogue pure narrative, epic which was a mixture of dialogue and narrative and lyric poetry was excluded by Plato as a non-mimetic mode. When we come to Aristotle, we see that it was extended to again based on mimesis, based on imitation on four types of classical genres which was tragedy which was given the highest form of uh, uh, of expression, literary expression, superior dramatic dialogue, then the epic, then comedy and lastly parody as an inferior mixed narrative. Well, now when we really want to look at literatures uh, and understanding literature and our approach to literature, we look into the common definition of literature, how it covers the major genres of poetry, drama and novel and fiction. Well, today we are going to cover mostly on the first uh, most uh, popular genre of literary expression novel and according to the modern critics or according to the scholars genres in literature have been more or less classified into this uh, domains novel, drama, poetry, autobiography, short story, essay and biography. Well, so we come now to the novel where I think each one of us as students of literature or students of science or of engineering you must have had that experience of uh, being so involved in a novel or in a book that you could not literally put it down. So, what was it that was that grasped you or that involved you? Actually, what we were engaged in, if we really look into the, the whole process of reading, it was basically a storytelling method, a narrative art per se. If we go back into the etymological meaning of fact and fiction, we will see that fact comes from Latin facie to make or do and fiction comes from Latin finger to make or shape. This explains that a novel or a fictional narrative whether it is factual, whether it is fictional in any medium is about the essentials of storytelling, about narrating a tale or a story. Novel is per se about storytelling. Let us take note of all the different ways now in which one can define the novel. Is it about the story? What grasp you? Is it about the characters? Is it about the plot? that emphasizes the relationship between character and incident or is it mostly about the pattern and the rhythm that goes behind that storytelling. Most important literary genre it is supposed to be and the most popular yes, novels are not only products of writers imaginations, but can be any extended fictional narrative usually written in post. 
we do have the poetic novel, but usually it is written in the prose narrative. Virginia Woolf described it as the most pliable of all forms. You can experiment with its form, there is no set rule that it should begin like this, it should end like this. While E. M. Foster defines the novel simply as a fiction in prose of a certain extent. Well, therefore, the novel is, if we trace back to the etymology of the word novel now, we had seen the word fact and fiction etymologically how it also uh, interchanges, exchanges uh, uh, its own qualities, but the word novel which was not even used until the end of the 18th century, the word came into pro, uh, actually came into being in the 18th century, it is an English transliteration of the Italian word novel or novella and an anonymous writer has said that it is an extended fictional narrative usually written in prose. While not a fry, a scholar of a critic, a critic of literature, he has given the novel, he had called the novel a low mimetic mode, not as high as the drama or poetry. Well, so now we come to what is a novel. A novel is the same as a story, but is longer and more complex. It is just storytelling, it is just narrating and the story always has so many components to it, how it begins, where it ends how does it reach to a climax, what are the characters involved in it, what is the conflict which is there, what are the moral issues which are being shown, how much of humor is there, how much of irony is there. So, according to Percy Lubbock, one of the uh, 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 stalwarts of, uh, of criticism on the novel, he had said that it is an imaginary work in prose of a considerable length which presents as real certain characters living in a given environment and describes their attitudes, fate and adventure. So, the very act of writing a novel offers what? An objective viewpoint, does not it? Of the world which is rooted in the subjectivity of its author. So, you are uh, the author and you are talking about the objective world. So, this domain of the object and the subject is very much uh, rooted. Being born at the same time as modern science, the novel shares to its investigative spirit. Well, when we are uh, at the background of, uh, of uh, talking about the interpretation of text or interpretation of uh, a genre or a genre, we find that in uh, understanding literature, it is always better to be equipped with two modes of understanding a text, the manner and the matter. So, the matter is the content and the manner is the technique. So, these are the ways that we always have to see how the story is being told, the technique of the story and the content of the story. Yet, the English novel from Defoe to Wolf is still a kind of romance, even though we see that with modern science the novel shares its investigative spirit, we find that if we look into trace the evolution of the novel as such from the 16th, 17th centuries, we find that somewhere or other there are the elements of romance attached to it, we cannot escape from that, a kind of epic of a prosaic modern world. And wherever we read, whether we read Tolstoy's War and Peace, Dr. Zhivago, Boris Pesternik, all Russian novelists or Hemingway's Old Man and the Sea coming closer home. If we read uh, so many other Salman Rushdie, we have Vikram Seth, we always find that there is somewhere that element of romance, that element of mystique which has been added to sociological. Uh, portraiture or to life as it has been told. Some do retain myth, fable, folk, to, folk tale and romances. Well, so let us now look into the long history of its evolution, right. So, the Russian cultural theorist Michael Bakhtin traces the novel back to imperial Rome, an ancient Hellenistic romance. I, I do believe because of its roots, because of its origin, this is where the mystique of the novel still persists. It must have 
left fragments of it always in the presentation. However, experiments had gone on in the making of the novel. This historical roots both in uh, novel not only has uh, goes back to imperial Rome and Hellenistic romances, but it has historical roots both in the fields of short compact broadly realistic medieval tales in early modern romances of Boccaccio, the Cameron and also by uh, Anne de Heptameron, a collection of tales of love composed by Marguerite, the Queen of Navarre and others. Created as a form for preservation of oral literatures of various cultures, it grew to include epics, romances, adventures like the Arthurian legend and knighthood. So, I think somewhere or the other when we look into this background it helps us to understand how the novel has evolved through the ages and how from the myths and fables to the romances it has gone into the modern novel of ours. Many currents have come together to produce the English novel because we are more or less concentrating on the, in, on the English novel. Let us see what are the currents which have gone in the making of the English novel. The actual novel form actually developed through the memoir, which we will be dealing with later in the form of autobiography. And novel and epistolary novel of the 16th and 17th centuries to the novel of the omniscient third person narrator, which has dominated from the late 18th century to the present time. The long history of the novel's evolution, therefore, if we go back, we see that it is the oral tales of myths and fables, then things which were written storytelling in the form of the epic, then written prose fiction concerned with adventure known as the romance. French word for the novel is roman, then it comes down to the Elizabethan prose tales and my new Elizabethan age was the age of poetry, it was called the nest of singing birds, but yet at that time we find that the uh, Elizabethan prose tales took a form of its own and this again comes down to the written prose fiction concerned with reality or actual life and new in English is novel in the 17th. So, used in this modern sense the word novel appears in England in the mid 19th century, when it was chiefly associated with the romances of illicit love, before it did not somehow enter into the canon of English literature, something which was uh, uh, sort of written by uh, clandestine affairs and uh, where it was uh, 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 preoccupation of the uh, of the lazy aristocracy and the novel form developed through the memoir novel and epistolary novels and for this reason the word history was more often favored to describe the long prose fiction of the 18th century which were precursors of the modern novel so people were cherry of using the word novel which didn't have uh, somehow the, the uh, enjoyed the high pedestal of the literary canon. Well, let us now look who was the first novelist if we can term it uh, uh, in English literature or in world literature. It could have been the Spanish Cervantes who wrote Don Quixote or the very English Daniel Defoe. Verily, the novel became the dominant form of creative literature in the mid 18th century. If you go back to the 10th century, many say that Saucer, Geoffrey Saucer was the father of English prose. His prologue to the uh, Canterbury Tales, it has all the qualities of the modern novel, yet we do not term it as the modern novel per se. Daniel Defoe and his novel Robinson Crusoe in around 1719 and later uh, Defoe's Small Flanders actually set the structure and themes of the novel. So, this is in the 18th century that we find that the novel really comes into the forefront. Many currents come together to produce the English novel, Elizabethan prose tales, picaresque stories, accounts of the urban underworld represented one. Now, when we have seen how this has gone into the making of the novel as such, the character writers of the 17th century develop a technique of psychological portraiture which was available to Edison and Still. Edison and Still were prose writers, they were essayists. So, you can see the shift which was going on from, from journalism to 
novel and from novel to journalism. So, the, the, the techniques of writing or the manner of writing or expression was somehow being reflected one on the other. And even the narrative style used by Bunyan in the Pilgrim's Progress and the somewhat similar factual style of Defoe's journalistic writing also helped to make the fully realized novel possible in the uh, 18th century itself. So, we are here in the 18th century, which was supposed to be the age of the novel as such. Samuel Richardson Pamela published in 1740 is noted by many literary critics to be the first major novel and Daniel Defoe's was the first novel as such or Cervantes um, Don Quixote, but as a mature novel with all the qualities with all its components of a novel, uh, many trace it back to that to research since Pamela, because it deals with the issues of social class as well as of love. Even Henry Fielding in 1742, Joseph Andrews were the first well rounded characters and essential quality to the novel appeared. So, the rise of the novel in the 18th century, this is a very important part and this was because of the what would you call it um, the reception by the public to the novel that it became popular in the later ages and we have to thank them that the 18th century received the novel as a form of literary expression. Therefore, the rise of the novel in the 18th century written by Defoe, Richardson and Fielding was partly due to its milieu, it was partly because of the readership and the people who had really welcomed the novel and particularly the changing social and economic shifts as a result of the industrial revolution. So, the chief novelist of the 18th century Defoe, Richardson, Fielding, Smollett, Stern, Lawrence Stern so greatly and rapidly developed the form that by the early 19th century, Jane Austen who dominated like Colossus in the 19th century could write in Northanger Abbey, one of our novels that in the novel the greatest powers of the mind are displayed. This is a form, this is a genre which was the most suitable for all the powers of the mind. So, we come to the 19th century. The 19th century was the great age of the English novel. It was because of the rise of the middle class with its new leisure, with its new modes of entertainment, entertainment because they had money to spend, they were literate, they had new markets, there was publishing firms, well time etcetera etcetera. Partly because of the steady increase of the reading public with the growth of lending libraries, the development of publishing in the modern sense and other things really developed during this time and the industrial revolution around uh, 18th century to the middle of 19th century, you find this were the causes which really accelerated the growth of the novel. The novel became the dominant form of creative literature in the mid 19th century, if not earlier. So, the growth of cities, urban population, more reading public, literary exchanges, literary um, um, interconnections to present a picture of life lived in a given society in different situation of social mobility, realism, reporters, psychological interventions, everything that you have was here and therefore, it led to the proliferation of the novel. Rightly so, with the creation of industry therefore, this new social and economic class of people, the middle class could criticize the restrictive culture of industrial England in Jane Austen's first novel Sense and Sensibility, which was a portraiture of that class as for a real picture of what daily life in industrial England was. We have Charles Dickens with his huge collection all magnum opuses of, uh, of, his, uh, of, his, of his novels, hard times we have illustrates the appalling working conditions that factory workers faced. Maybe the exception somewhere was Wuthering Heights of Emily Bronte, which is often regarded as an archetype of the tortured romantic hero, which was not so much a reflection of the social you know uh, industrial times, but more of the traumas of the romantic hero. Therefore, let us now look into the multiple genres and structural forms of this genre of the novel itself. 
If we look into John Steinbeck's coming to the 20th century, we find in the early 20th century around uh, the middle of the 20th century, John Steinbeck, Nobel laureate John Steinbeck in his Graves of Wrath, you can call it a historical novel, where he traces the, 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 the journey of the Oki farmers who come from the east to the west. Then the historical novel, we have Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace, which talks about the Napoleonic Wars, the invasion to Russia, a huge masterpiece and many people go back to it for, for uh, reference. Then we have Arya Maria, uh, Maria Remarque, a German writer, all quiet on the western front, talks about the horrors of the first world war. Then the Bildungsroman novel. Bildungsroman is something like a, like a story of uh, initiation, where a character develops from the stage of initiation, from the stage of uh, understanding to the stage of, uh, of uh, maybe redemption or acknowledging his, acknowledging what life is. So, Bildungsroman novel, we have the adventures of Huckleberry. Finn, we have the adventures of Tom Sawyer, Mark Twain's and which was supposed to be the, the, the primal source of all American literature, which talks of freedom, which talks of uh, different aspects of the social uh, variations. Then we do have uh, another very well known uh, uh, novel by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin which goes back into the tradition of the slave narratives in the antebellum period that is in the American civil war, talks about a slave even though it is not written by a black, uh, I mean by a uh, African American writer by a uh, uh, native. So, we find that it was one of the first almost uh, uh, fiction which said that uh, let the uh, world see what was the condition of America during the antebellum period. The world of Jane Austen and P. G. Woodhouse, if we look into here, two different uh, you know novelists, many of you must have been uh, reading P. G. Woodhouse in your school days, a most popular novelist who writes in the vein of Jane Austen and his main uh, tool is humor. Not that he is a realistic writer as such, but then you have to see that he takes it as the ancient lineage of comedy and when we look into their novels, whether of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility and uh, P. G. Woodhouse's uh, Bertie Wooster series. Jeeves series, then we find that there is a, uh, there is a intended uh, reflection of what they want to show. Yet, both these writers have succeeded in transforming them into versatile timeless comedies. You can even put them into popular culture, because they are so popular the age uh, variations of the, re, uh, of the readerships may come from 10 years to a 70 year old man. So, Jane Austen's marvelous superb comic effects of selected incidents, her characterization and her shafts of wit act like a late motive, it goes on repeating on Woodhouse who is specially concerned with the significance of incidents rather than the incidents themselves. So, what did Jane Austen do? She was to apply the techniques of the novel to the acute observation of society in microcosm. Three, that this is what she says, three or four families in a country village was the little bit of ivory on which I work, so fine a brush as produces little effect after much labor, she wrote in her letters. So, it was the minute of life that she had. Uh, portrayed, it was in the very, very close reading of the suburban society that she was used to. She was to apply the microscope to human character and motivation, 
with no great didactive moral or satiric purpose as representation of universal patterns of behavior. Well, and continuing this uh, comic tradition, we find P. Z. Woodhouse, 1881 to 1975, one of the greats of modern uh, fiction, as one of the most popular novelists of the 20th century. He it was who had revolu revolutionized the modern comic novel during his 75 year career. He, what did he create? when you go into the world of P. G. Woodhouse, it is absolutely a different world altogether. It is a world of bumbling aristocrats, masterful servants, where the servants have the better, they are better off than the masters, strong young women and eminent loony doctors. Besides introducing characters set in the typical English countryside, what did he do? He depicted a behavior of a class of people. It was a gentle satire, if not a satire at all, working on the vanity, triviality and misunderstanding of endless social rounds. For him, the comic was generally a matter of a three corner relation, the agent, the victim and the reader. Well, so when we come to again another form genre of the genre of novel, that is the picaresque novel. The picaresque novel, where the picaro, Spanish word picaro means scoundrel and the main character is a very likable scoundrel or a rascal like we have in Henry Fielding's Tom Jones. Then we have the trilogy novels where it goes into different different uh, 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 sections, the novelette or novella, uh, then the science fiction, we have mysteries like murder on the Orient Express, we have fantasy like many of you are familiar with that Harry Potter series and romances like Dr. Jivago and magic realism in uh, novelists like Sal Salman Rushdie, Midnight Children and some of the Latin American writers. Therefore, we have seen the comic realm has been also intruded, the tragic, the social, the realistic and it is somewhere that the genres have overlapped in this genre of the novel. So, Arist Aristotle would have been shocked, he had only put it into three, uh, he had only divided it into four categories. So, history, realism, romance and fantasy, between the extreme of history and fantasy, on such a scale we might locate two major points of reference something like this. If we read Honest Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea, a classic, a modern classic written in 1951. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, the greats of the American literature, High Seas Adventure, Lord of the Rings by J. R. R. Tolkien, Lord of the Flies by William Golding and Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude, more or less magic realism which he had mingled realistic and fantastic details. So, we have seen that form and content now, design and representation. Reconcile in narrative as a whole, conversing on style. The clarity of an Austin, we have seen Jane Austen, where she portrays the minute of life as if it is realistic, uh, you live life in the realistic level, to the modernist opacity of a Joyce, when James Joyce and Virginia Woolf wrote the stream of consciousness method. Uh, novels, it was based on the, the variation of the, 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 of the consciousness level of a person. So, you can call it transparent at the same time opaque and at the same time you would find that those were studies of psychological interpretation. In his classic study of the novel, the great tradition, the critic F. R. Lewis defines a truly great novel in two chief ways. So, Lewis says, points it out as such, it must display what he calls number one, a reverent openness before life and it must reveal an organic form. So, it must have a structure. You as students of uh, engineer, uh, engineering disciplines, you might be surprised to see that literature too has its structures, literature too has its organic form 
and any genre that we are studying, it has its own grammar, it has its own uh, hierarchy of structures and in doing, in knowing about this, it helps us to appreciate the text better probably and probably our approach to literature or to the different genres of literature uh, becomes a bit different and it becomes more appreciative or it becomes more uh, rewarding. The trouble is that these two requirements were not easily compatible with each other. If you took look, uh, look into the reverent openness before life that you have to be open to life at the same time you have to look into the organic form. So, rather they would only be truly compatible if life itself were to reveal an organic form. So, however much F. R. Lewis had said about this being a uh, novel having an organic form, you might see that in the modern novel there have been many many variations, many many experiments with form and sometimes you do not have a form at all. Sometimes you do not have uh, uh, a technique at all and uh, the technique to develop that technique as, uh, as uh, Hemingway had said that it was the most difficult aspect of, of uh, literary expression to write simply was the most difficult thing to do and to write a simple sentence he said which was true to life was the most uh, difficult thing for a novelist to uh, do. Now, let us look at what makes the structure of a novel. Okay, going back to F. R. Lewis notwithstanding, we might see for the sake of maybe seeing the structure of a novel as such, we might see as ordinary readers not as a critic, because we will come into that critical uh, uh, theorization of text, interpretation of text, but here as a simple uh, uh, reader of a novel, we might see six elements used by authors. right? So, the most important elements of a novel is plot. What is plot? It is usually a triad of arrangement of the story going through initiation, then conflict leading to a climax or denouement just like in drama. It has that you have the opening first, the characters are introduced or the setting is introduced or the story is introduced that is the first part, then the second part is the, the where the conflict goes on, where the entire uh, story is being told and then it leads to the third part which is the denouement. Sometimes there are parallels of the story within the story which are the subplots. We will find this likeness also in drama, in the genre of drama. Then comes the theme which is the central idea which runs through the novel may be a moral to the story which gives the narration focus, unity, impact and the point. Then comes the setting of time, whether it is day, night, the seasons, the historical period, is it 19th century, modern period or the 20th century, specific town, locale, country, physical space, real or fictional. This includes mood or an atmosphere too, like the Atlantic Ocean in Moby Dick, Melville's Moby Dick. Then we have characterization. Characterization is one important factor in, in, in a novel and where there may be sub characters, there may be flat characters, there may be dominant characters, round characters and the symbols which are used, a dominant uh, symbol which is used, a metaphor that has been used, maybe opening of windows it can be right or sometimes it may be a river which goes on coming as a, as a late motif or sometimes it may be a sound, it may be a piece of music, it may be a fragrance. So, this is a symbol which is used different ways that techniques are being used. And last not the least the language, the language is one which really marks the novelist and it was Hemingway who had got the Nobel prize, he received the Nobel prize for modern narration, it was not so much for the content, but the way a novel has to be novel or a story could be narrated and you find that the language is the tool for novelist right and it is true irony the, the, the way they use uh, sentences the way they use methods like in Thomas Hardy's far from the madding crowd which is uh, uh, the irony starts from the title itself 
irony is something which is just the opposite of what you intend to say. It is a figure of speech based on difference. It is a rhetorical device. So, all these rhetorical devices which are used by the novelist to express his story. Now, E. M. Foster like Lubbock takes on seven elements. We had discussed six elements, but he had said that there were seven elements vital to a novel in his aspects of the novel, which is a landmark in uh, literary criticism. He says number one is the story, then the people like the character, then the plot, then fantasy. Fantasy is a wonder, is something which adds to it. Then a prophecy, which anticipates what is going to come. Then the pattern, which moves, it is almost like the structure and also the rhythm, which follows in a, in a, in a novel. Like in music, when you listen to music, you find that there is a particular rhythm. Is it fast or is it flat? Right? And when you find that it is at even pace, or even if it goes slow, somewhere the 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 the, the uh, impression of the novelist or the story gets diluted. He not only defines uh, Foster; he was the first who had uh, spoken about such terms as round versus flat characters, right? And why both are needed for an effective novel. But also provides examples of writing from such literary greats as Dickens and Austin. Well, Percy Lubbock, however, okay, in his The Craft of Fiction, which was published around 1966, he insists upon the point of view. He talks that it is not so much the storytelling, it is not so much the narrative structure. Of course, all these are implied, but it is the point of view and much about the virtue of showing rather than telling. So, how you show rather than tell, it is almost like uh, the what Aristotle had made a difference between mimesis and diegesis. Mimesis is imitation and diegesis is narration. Right? So, novel is almost like a visual portrayal right? and therefore, he has to show rather than tell a story. A story can be told as he said in many different ways. This is from his book, the art of fiction does not begin until the novelist thinks of the story as a matter to be shown, to be so exhibited that it will tell itself. To hand over the reader the effects of the story merely as so much information, this is no more than to state the argument of the book. The book is not a row of facts, I quote, it is a single image. The facts have no validity in themselves. It is not the simple art of narrative, but the comprehensive art of fiction that I am considering. And in fiction, there can be no appeal to any authority outside the book itself. These are famous lines of Lubbock when he had concentrated on the points of view, whether it is from the first person or from the second person or from the third person. 20th century literary theory, if we look into it now, I had referred to the critic's opinion of, of a novel or critic's interpretation of a text. When we look at the criticism as such, we will be dealing with it in the different modules of uh, this domain and we will see that the subject matter of literary criticism is an art. And criticism is evidently something of an art too, just like the creator, the creative artist, the novelist or the poet or the dramatist. One who looks into the creative art or the creative piece, he, his occupation is also that of an artist itself. Every art however, needs its own critical organization and we pose the novel as a question, since it has been the center of all critical discourse. And always we find that it is the novel which has been taken as an important medium for critical discourse. Whether it is formalism, whether it is structuralism, whether it is narratology, deconstruction of Derrida, where you completely see the text from binary objects, psychoanalysis from psychology, Marxism from sociology and history, gender and sexuality, postcolonialism texts from the postcolonial angle reader response theory, cultural studies, 
everywhere that we see, these are the directions in which we look into a text. So, when we look in suppose a old man and the sea, if you look into it from the post colonial narrative or if you look uh, interpret the text from the Marxist uh, uh, angle or from cultural studies, it will have different interpretation of the text. It will have different uh, uh, you can say ideas of what the author meant to say. Maybe the author never meant to say what he meant to say when, when this interpretation comes in. Right. So, let me give you an example from uh, how V S Naipaul's half a life, Nobel laureate V S Naipaul, how his uh, novel half a life can be seen from the post colonial uh, perspective, right? from the post colonial uh, uh, critical theory. I am not going into the nitty gritties of the critical uh, theories as such, but just giving you an idea that in Naipaul's half a life has been hailed as one of the most incisive analysis of the post colonial paradox. To analyze the disintegrating networks of the unanchored soul, one who becomes almost rootless, he does not know where he belongs, stored in memory in multiple layers with the psychotherapic other, which is used as a refuse to interpret the journey through the transcultural world, where he belongs to so many worlds, but he does not know where his actual homeland is. The failed coda in Naipaul's world thus becomes a disengaged experience of the expert right with a scribbling sense of dislocation and displacement. Well, when we look into Naipaul's half a life, we are looking into reading the text not only from the post colonial angle, we are looking into the language that is being written. The language also has a different vocabulary, it has a different way of uh, giving the masses. Well, another angle if we look into no, Nobel laureate Patrick White, Australian uh, novelist, one of the most powerful novelists of the 20th century especially in his um, uh, tree of men, where he employs so many of the, the, the forms of narrative, which are also prevalent in the other side of the world, maybe from Buddhism, from mandalic uh, consciousness, from psychological interpretation of the self, apart from the course polo colonial disengagement with its root, uh, with his roots. So, it was to overcome the exaltation of the average that Patrick White had conceived the tree of man, which was an attempt to portray every possible aspect of life through the lives of an ordinary man and woman, and at the same time to discover the extraordinary behind the ordinary. So, you find that this is almost what Jane Austen had tried to do. She had looked into the ordinary man and woman, and she said, and even as D. H. Lawrence, one of the most eminent modern novelists of, of 20th century, British novelist, he had said, you take two families, and when you enact a story out of these two families, you get a novel. Same way we find in the tree of man, um, Patrick White, he brings in the story of an ordinary man and woman and makes it almost like a universal uh, tale of love, suffering, everything else. And it is the story of a pioneering farmer, Stan Parker, who comes and settles on a small isolated part of a virgin wilderness near Sydney. In course of time, he marries, he has children. The theme, therefore, is in a sense nothing but the assertion of the indomitable will to strike roots, despite formidable odds with assail life endlessly. So, we have two sides of the same coin. We have Naipaul here in half a life, the unanchored soul. Here we have one who is trying to find anchor in, in the in, uh, in his surroundings. Well, specially important and specially beautiful are the openings of novels. We do remember the openings, the beginnings of poems, the beginnings of, of uh, a drama like in Hamlet, it started with an interrogation in Shakespeare's Hamlet, why okay? or who. Same way, 
in novels they have become epigrams by themselves. The first lines of some popular novels have become epigrams. Happy families are all alike. This is from Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, 19th century. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Somehow, it is the first line which almost sums up what the, what the entire novel is going to be. Then we have from Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities, again in the 19th century. This is a very, very well known beginning. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. So, where is this division between poetry and novel? You find the beginning itself is so poetic and it has been almost, uh, uh, it tells about what is going to come. This famous uh, uh, beginning from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, 19th century, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. And Daphne de, de Maurier's Rebecca, last night I dreamed I went to Mendeley again. From Virginia Woolf's first famous opening in Mrs. Dalloway, that is a novel in 1925. Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself, simple opening a statement that is being given all right and it is almost the way that the stream of consciousness method develops after that okay how her mind works then we have hemingway one of the great moderns american writer in farewell to arms he writes in the late summer of that year we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plain to the mountains you just note the simplicity of his narrative over here, as I had said earlier, Hemingway was, uh, he worked upon this, how to write simply on modern narrative and it was the, the theory of implication. It was like the iceberg theory, where a word has to imply, it does not have to tell everything. So, the theory of implication will be uh, embedded into the narrative. So, the words will become symbols of implications. So, it is not that everything has to be uh, told in great detail. This was again from the old man and the sea. He was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream and he had gone 84 days now without taking a fish. Note the numbering 84, 84 days. Right? So, these are all techniques of numbering, techniques of narration, which brings in space, length and whatever magnitude of the problem discussed. So, if novel is the modern epic, as it is in George Lucas's famous phrase, the epic of a world abandoned by God, it must strive for sense and unity in an age, when things no longer seem to hover any inherent meaning or value. The novel is a sign of our freedom. Yet, the very act of writing a novel offers an alternative to this condition. Since, a novel's objective vision of the world is one rooted in the subjectivity of the author. Right. So, discussion, let us come to it. When we ask uh, questions on the novel form, what main ideas, themes does the author explore? Very, very common questions that you can answer by yourself. Find one specific idea, event or behavior in the book, any book that you take that relates to real life. Explain the relationship you see. Does the plot have unity? Are all the episodes relevant to the total meaning or effect of the story? Does this incident grow logically out of the preceding incident? Is each character developed enough to justify his role in the story? Does the theme reinforce or oppose popular notions of life? So, all the other notions of life which comes into it. What point of view does the story use? Is it consistent in the use of this point of view? If shifts are made, are they justified? 
So, we come to the end of our lecture on novel and the text that were used here was on literature criticism and theory, David Dyser's a critical theory, history of English literature, E. M. Foster's aspect of the novel, Lubbock's the craft of fiction, Eagleton's the English novel and the concise Oxford companion to English literature, Margaret Rebels and uh, Robert Soule's elements of literature. Thank you.